I had some time to spare during my second coronavirus quarantine. This time it was my wife who got the virus and thought to share with you a secret I've discovered long ago and have used in many projects I've worked on for the past several years. I call it sequentially animating attributes. This is the example I will build. You can animate all the objects with one slider and furthermore you can control the offset of that animation per object using this other slider. What's so special about that, you might ask? That's easily done using a simple plane effector and a linear falloff or a field. More often than not, that might be the case, but there are other situations where a linear field is not an option. Just to illustrate my point, imagine having the cubes cloned around in a circle. You want to move them outwards away from the center, and rotate them one after the other. But the linear field has no way of knowing their order. And furthermore, as great as MoGraph is, the range of properties that it can work with is limited to position, rotation, scale, color, and time offset. And there are a lot more possibilities left outside of that range. For example, morphing, or let's say selection groups. I will start to demonstrate the concept with this simple scene using Expresso, but later we'll show you how to convert everything to MoGraph language or even Python. Remember it's a technique rather than a tool and can be applied even outside of Cinema 4D realm. Start by adding an Expresso tag to the master null. Select Add User Data from the User Data menu. This will be the slider that will control our animation. Give it a name. Don't change the data type, but select Float Slider as the interface. Leave it at that for now. In the Expresso Editor, add a hierarchy node. By default, it returns a list of the immediate children of the object where the Expresso tag is attached, which is what we want, the list of cubes. Click on the output side of the node and make the count board visible. Now add an object index node to get the index number for each of those cubes in the list. This is what's getting into Expresso. Now let's set up the output. Add an object node and in the path field of its attribute window type capital D. I'll tell you why in a moment. By default, any object node that you add from the menu inside the Expresso editor is set to relative reference mode and points to the object in the objects manager where the Expresso tag is attached. In our case, that's the master node. A relative path means relative to the Expresso tag. So if you drag the Expresso tag to another object, the object node inside the Expresso editor points to this newly attached object in the object manager. The reason I typed a capital D is so that the object node points to the first child of the master null, which stands directly under it in the hierarchy. D stands for down. Other possible options are N for next, P for previous, and U for up. It's a nice way to navigate the hierarchy. I could also have just dragged one of the children cubes into the editor, as I have seen done in other tutorials, but that would have created an absolute path which points to that exact object. If for any reason later in the process you delete that object or replace it with some other one, the node pointing to it would no longer know what to point to, and as a result, the whole Expresso tag would not calculate. You would have to manually update the link by redragging the object node every time you change or delete it. The extra step of writing down a path won't matter if you're only manipulating general properties of an object, like transformation, name or display color. But you will definitely find it useful for other properties that are specific to one type of 3D object. It's a good habit to make your object's reference mode relative as much as you can. Another benefit is that you can also attach the Expresso setup 
to another object with a similar hierarchy and it would work the same. Now back to work. Connect the instance output of the object index node to the object input of our cube node. You have to understand that because the hierarchy node outputs not one but a list of objects, our output object represents not just itself but all the children of the master node. So whatever attribute we change and feed to it will in fact be reflected on all its siblings in the object manager. Drag and drop the Expresso tag itself to the editor and make the animation port visible. Multiply the animation output with the count and from that product subtract the index number. Feed the remainder to the Y position of the output object. It may not be apparent, but the cubes in the 3D view jumped one unit from each other up in the Y axis. Let us emphasize this by adding a multiplier to the result, let's say 50 cm. Now the difference should be more visible. Drag the animation slider forwards and back. As you can see, the cubes move all together, maintaining a 50 cm distance from each other. All fine and good, but it doesn't look at all like what we expected. It will in a moment. Add a clamp node and link the subtract node output to its value input. Set the max value to 1. This will put a ceiling to the maximum height the cubes can travel and also a ground floor for the minimum low. Play around with the animation slider to prove it. Now we're talking. The cubes slide upwards one after the other, each one starting when the previous has finished moving. But wouldn't it be great to have their movement sequence overlap by some custom amount? That would make the animation way less robotic and more organic. We'll start by adding a new slider to the user data tab. Rename it to offset. Change the interface to float slider and the default value to 50%. You can always change that later. Now drag the Expresso tag again in the editor, make the offset port visible and multiply it with the index number before the subtraction takes place. Duplicate it again and this time multiply it by the count number before the multiplication with the animation value takes place. Let's test it by moving the animation slider. Now each of the cubes starts moving when the previous one has traveled half the way. Let's play with the offset value also. Set it to 25% and move the animation slider. An offset of 100% gives us the result we had at the beginning so we haven't lost anything so far. You should have noticed though that for a lower than 100% offset value, the cubes don't travel to their end position. That means that the animation slider should get longer than 100%. We can do that easily, but we will have to counter adjust it every time the offset value changes. There's a better solution. Duplicate the offset node again. Add a constant node with a value of 1. Now subtract the offset from 1 and add the result to the right after the first multiplication node before it's multiplied with the animation. Now whatever offset you choose, the cube's movement and animation value both fit perfectly. That makes animating way easier. Another thing worth mentioning is that you can now rearrange the cubes inside the hierarchy in the order that you wish and you will have the animation follow that new order. Or you could reverse the order in which the cubes animate 
by adding a couple of other math nodes to the tree. Subtract 1 from the count number of the hierarchy and then subtract the index number from it. Remember that all this calculation results in the 0 to 1 range. We multiplied it by 50 in this example to make it more apparent. The setup is applicable in many situations and not just for position, rotation or scale. In this other example, I make use of it to animate and offset the morphing state of these cubes transforming themselves into these other geometric shapes. To have the setup at hand at any time, you could also wrap all its stones into an X group and save that into the X pool. And another more complex example is this one, a project I did for Digital, my previous employing company, where I have interpolated the transformations of the pieces that form the logo between three different states. The first state stores the matrix transformation of the pieces on the ground. On the second state, the pieces move just near their final position in the mosaic, and the third state brings all the pieces into their final position. Of course, I have used three different setups like the one I showed you now, and mixed their animation and offset values. There are no dynamics involved in this shot at all. I showed the setup here in Expresso, because that's the only way I worked when I discovered it, and that's how it made more sense to me back then. But it can be translated into code if that's what you're more comfortable with. Let me lay it out in pseudocode. We first multiply animation by the count number and subtract the index. Later we multiply both count and index by the offset. Then we add the difference of subtracting the offset from 1 to the count times offset result. Last, we clump everything to the 0 to 1 range. We can later on multiply the final result to whichever value we need. This code can be ported to both Python and MoGraph setups. I'm optimistic that I'll record more examples of this setup in use and show both other methods then. Just wanted to make this a separate video to better explain the concept. In fact, this is the subject of my first ever recorded tutorial back in 2014. It was part of a competition for under one minute tutorial videos. The prize was a free ticket to the Cinema 4D Advanced Production Techniques workshop that was held in Berlin. Of course I didn't win, but it gave me the right push to continue recording tips and tricks for the Cinema 4D community and as an archive for myself. First soundless and now hopefully better with voiceover. I really think this technique deserved a separate video on its own. I hope for you to find a use for it as I did. Enough talking now. As always, ask questions in the comment section and please share the knowledge. Until next time, bye.